Hello and welcome back to the first episode of the Eden Road podcast of the 2024-25 season. We're doing it on a very positive note. Obviously, Brentford have come away from the first game of the season with a 2-1 win over Crystal Palace yesterday. We're recording this on Monday night, so some fresh reaction. Really looking forward to this one. Going to be a nice positive start to the season after what was a pretty depressing year last year. Joining me tonight, Dan, how are we, mate? All good. Joint top of the league. Let's make it. Let's make fun of it whilst it lasts. Exactly. Craig, how are you? Absolutely buzzing off of that one. Did the uh, the Crystal Palace pod on Friday, which showed that both teams were a bit comprehensive going into this one, but I'm glad that we've come out on top. Exactly that, exactly that. And just before we get into Tweet of the Week, and I, I do have a few this week, if anyone saw me and Dan or Dan and I before the game doing some flyer in, uh, it was great to see so many people come up to us and just say, um, you know, keep doing what we're doing with the pod. Hopefully we'll get a few more new listeners this week, but it's definitely something we're going to do again. I think I bought 500 of them and I think we shifted a good sort of four fifths of that. So if there's another chance sort of maybe later on in the season, I'll definitely do that again. But like, thanks to everyone that came up to us and said hi. And hopefully we've got some more listeners this week. Dan, do you want to, did you give a fly to Matthew Benham? <laughs> I did give a flyer to Matthew Ben. I've given him out so quickly and people were just coming so quickly. And he he, he basically had the flyer before I realised you're Matthew Ben. Yeah, but, no. yeah, hopefully he's listening. Even yeah, Matthew. 100%. 100%. Good evening, Matthew. I, I was halfway through giving him one and then I realised who he was and I was like, you probably you probably don't need this, mate. So I just stopped. But it was it was it was it was really like cool experience to be fair because you were you were saying people are just going to lap it up and I was kind of a bit less optimistic about it. I thought people would be telling me to fuck off, but it was actually pretty decent. Like managed to shift quite a few of them. People were keen to know what it was, what it was about. So yeah, if you did see us, thanks for coming to say hello. Let's let's move on to tweet of the week. Um, few entries this week. One from our famous Chelsea fan, Rory Jennings. He seems to be more and more rattled by Brentford as the weeks go by, which I think is fucking hilarious, considering how much he bangs on about us being a small club, but decides to to tweet about us at basically every opportunity i mean the club <laughs> the club's like little promotional video when when they kind of compiled all of the the uh like all of the people saying that brentford should go down and whatnot i thought that was really funny and then he, he bit at that and then he bit at the fact that tony wasn't even playing as well so shout out to rory jennings shout out to the special uh, special shout out to the palace fans getting rattled by freed from desire at full time i thought that was quite funny seeing so so many tweets about the west stand going crazy and them still in the away end getting rattled by it. I, I think Palace, I don't know if they carried on or if they're still doing it this season, but they were playing Wenger boys last season after every goal. So, um, isn't, uh, isn't that the same Crystal Palace that set a flare off after a nil-nil draw last season? Yeah, potentially. So, you know, piss-boiling antics, we, we can do it too. But the winner this week, Super B's first and definitely not the last appearance on this segment because he's got some absolute stinkers every week. But this is before kickoff, so this is a preemptive meltdown. I just like I do not understand. I don't know why the negative tweets of Brentford they just get pushed to the top of my Twitter. So it's just like all I see is negativity before a ball is even kicked. I said he says I cannot stress enough how disappointing this team sheet is. I'm not even bothered about Tony because that's out of our control. But having that back four for a Premier League opening game is a disgrace. The club should feel ashamed for letting Frank down in the transfer market. Dan is is the back four a disgrace? Would you say? I think the issue that they're getting at is the fact that we go into the season without a left back. Yeah. And I think that's a reasonable concern to have. I think surely the club in the next couple of weeks before the window closes will look at getting in a left back because even when Rico Henry's back, first of all, he's been out for the best part of a year. So, you know, it might take him a little while to get up to speed. And secondly, I think you always want two players for each position. And I'm not sure how sustainable it will be constantly having either Ayer at left back or, you know, a left back. So I, I agree to that extent. But, you know, we've still got the likes of Ethan Pinnock in there, who, you know, I love. I think at centre back we're quite we're quite sorted. And when everyone's fit, I think we've got a good back four. But obviously that's the issue, isn't it? The squad depth, I think. hundred percent. I think I, I get what he's getting at. It's just for me, Craig, the use of hyperbole. <laughs> the club should feel ashamed and it's a disgrace. The use of hyperbole, I, I just find hilarious. But what, what do you reckon, Craig? What, were you happy with the back four? Uh, I think we said it when we did the preview last week, Mike, that that's the back four that we fully expect when we go into this game. We've mm -hmm. seen it over the last couple of preseason games where that was the back four that started. So 
anyone that's surprised by that really really that surprises me than the fact that that was the back four because how can you not see that happening we literally played the last two preseason games with that back four how are yeah. you surprised by that how are you then shocked that that's the back four you know i mean it's just ugh. but like you said it won't be the last time this season that we see a, a tweet from him <laughs> no, it, it won't and i look forward to seeing them but yeah i do i understand where he's coming from just uh yeah. The wording sometimes I think is a bit over the top. Let's let's start with the Tony news because I think despite the result, somehow I, despite despite the result and the fact that he didn't play, somehow Ivan Tony is still the top line, and it's what everyone's talking about today. Um, obviously, he wasn't in the match day squad. It's come out since that Thomas Frank and the club decided to leave him out, and they made that decision on Thursday. But obviously, Thomas Frank in his pre-match press conference said that he was fit and ready to play. So it's definitely one that they're kind of keeping close to their cards, close to their chest. Reported to be a bid from Saudi Arabia from the public investment fund, and he's going to go to Al Ali. I think there's been one bid so far of around 35 million, but uh, it looks like his departure is going to be imminent. And I, it's a weird one, Craig, because you and I spoke about it on the preview episode, and we kind of agreed that it looked like he was going to stay. And then, like, that kind of came out of the blue. And for all, for everything that's gone on with Ivan Tony and the interviews and the amount he kind of bigged himself up. He's now at 28 years old, arguably at the peak of his powers, coming off the back of his debut international tournament with England. He's now going to Saudi Arabia, Craig. What are your thoughts? I did post a tweet saying that's the most Ivan Tony esque move that I could see him doing. But look, if there if the if the numbers are true and there's rumours of like 18 million pounds a year for three years. He's set his family financially for the rest of his life. He, yeah. that's, that is obviously a decision which he has to keep in mind. He's got two young children. That's something that he is he's definitely thinking about. Um, Football-wise, he's killed his England career. He's never going to play for England again. With that being said, whether he has the same relationship with Lee Carsley as he did do with Gareth Southgate is, is yet to be seen. But if he goes and when he goes by the looks of it i don't see him playing for england again unfortunately for him but financially it's it's the best deal he'll ever get in his life i mean yeah financially it, it makes a lot of sense it's, he's kind of set out his stall before the ban ended when he was about to come back that he wanted to move he's not got any options so instead of and it makes sense for brentford as well like it, it, we could let him run down his contract i'm sure thomas frank would want him at the club for another year dan but in terms of for him, because he's got no options in the Premier League, or it doesn't look like anyone's interested at the moment, why not go and make a eighteen million pounds a year? Yeah, I, I I just can't wait until this is all over because yeah, it's just dragging. It's it's been dragging on all summer. Will he stay? Won't he stay? Not much interest in him. Obviously, we've known for a long time that he doesn't really want to be at Brentford. I did think it would be a bit of a shame if he did go for free at the end of the season because there is money to be made there even though he didn't cost us a great deal in the first place. But, I mean, I can't see many other teams with paying almost 50 million, which is rumoured, for a player with one year left on their contract. And obviously, if anyone's going to pay that money, it'll be someone in Saudi. So I think from the Brentford side of things as well, I think this is a brilliant deal for us. He'll be a record sale, despite only having a year left on his contract. And that can be reinvested, hopefully into a left back, perhaps. Um, so I, I think it will work out all the way around. It is a shame that, you know, I, I see the dilemma for him. It's, you know, his career ambitions against, you know, the money. And obviously it might be influenced slightly because the, the top teams that he maybe thought would be after him haven't come in for him. So maybe that's decided for him. But yeah, I'm just pleased. Like when it when this is all over, I'll just be glad so then we can stop talking about it and you know we we finally know what's what. Absolutely. Yeah, hundred percent. I think it's just the 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 cash injection is healthy for the PSR balance as well. Like depending on when this deal gets over the line, it's an extra however much to spend either in this window or the upcoming window. So it makes it makes a lot of sense for Brentford. Um, are we ruling out to either of you? Are we ruling out any? Once a fee is it once a fee is agreed between the public investment fund in Saudi Arabia and Brentford, are we ruling out the possibility of of a bid coming in from somewhere? Do we think? 
the thing is, you kind of mentioned it. Who who has the money? Tottenham are set their stall by buying Solanke for sixty million. Chelsea is really the only thing, but it sounds like they're after Osman. So I don't know. I, I was listening to Talksport earlier, and, and they were kind of suggesting that once the fee gets agreed, don't be surprised if if another bid comes in from somewhere. But can can either of you see that happening? I think if Saudi want him, they'll pay more because yeah. they can do that. They they've got pockets so deep that if they really want him, they can just pay that little bit more and I and I think other teams given his age and given obviously the length of time on his contract it will just be reluctant to pay as much as we're likely to get from them for sure um but with, with oh, football right. you can with, with football you can't write anything off do you know what I mean yeah. you you really can't write anything off with football it, it's one of those uh, unpredictable things in life where it, one day is going to be completely different to the next. You know, we were talking about Ivan Tony playing for us for this season and the next day we're talking about him leaving for £50 million. So it, it's a completely unpredictable sport, which which, which actually makes it, like, really enjoyable, I will say. It makes it really enjoyable, the unpredictability of it. Not knowing what's around the corner means that while football has taken a turn over the past recent years on the pitch with VAR and poor referees and things like that off the pitch is always still unpredictable is always still exciting because you never know what's around the corner so i quite enjoy the unpredictability of it yeah it is, it is weird because we were literally recording the podcast the day before and we were saying we've got ivan tony for another season it's not the yeah. worst thing in the world we've only paid five million for him or whatever it came to in the add-ons and then the next day we're talking about it being a great deal for us and maybe we walk away with 60 million pounds but anyway Let's let's hope uh, Tony gets sorted. Maybe we'll probably might do like a specific episode just related to Tony once that deal does go through. Maybe just looking back on his time at Brentford. But Tony didn't play. Um, we spoke about the fluidity of the front three, Craig, on the preview in terms of what well, we thought it would be Tony in there. But in terms of the back end of last season, when we saw uh, how we well we played against Luton, uh, granted this time it was Shardor on the left and, and not KLP, but. Thoughts on the lineup? We've kind of spoken about the back line, but thoughts on the lineup, Craig, when you saw it in terms of going forward. Obviously, the midfield doesn't change too much, but the front three, it, it, it was that, that front three can cause a lot of teams a lot of problems. Yeah. Well, I, I'm just going to plug it one more time. I, I swear, I did do the Palace preview, and they said Ivan Tony's going to play on Sunday, isn't he? This was Friday evening. We did that at seven o'clock before the first game. And I said, I said, there's a real possibility that he is sold before we play the game on Sunday. And they, they go, no, there's no chance that happens. I said, mate, I've supported Brentford long enough to know that from 7 p.m. on a Friday up until the kickoff on two at two o'clock on a Sunday, anything, anything could change. And it literally did. Um, we said it right at the start. Back four was exactly what we expected to see. That, no surprises there. And and the midfield again, no surprises. Maybe. A little bit disappointed that we didn't see Damsgaard start, especially with the way that he finished last season. But without Ivan Tony, that's kind of exactly the front three that you expect it to be. Obviously, the only big difference come New Year will be Thiago plays instead of one of those three. But but I'm not surprised. That's exactly what I expected to see without Ivan Tony in it. Dan, what was your thoughts on the fullbacks? Because it's another season, or it looks like another season of Mansour Selev at right back. Potentially, depending on when Aaron Hickey comes back, <laughs> if Aaron Hickey comes back, he could be he could be dead for all we know. But we hope he comes back. But Aya on the left, I thought did okay. I want to say the f- the first kind of twenty minutes, he was a little bit shaky. But for someone who we signed as a centre back, who's barely played a centre back and mostly at right back, and he's now at left back as a right footer, I think he he did a pretty good job. Yeah, he, he did do okay. Okay, and any criticisms we have of people like I am playing at left back, it's not because of him. It's because we just don't have the cover there, the natural cover there. And I think we're always, even if it's not in this game, I think at some point this season, if we continue to play players out of position, we are going to get exposed in certain games. It's just going to happen. And I would like to think that we would still bring someone in the next couple of weeks. I know it's not easy when you're kind of trying to bring in players who have gone are going to be second choice, essentially. That's why I think, particularly Roslev on the right, I'm not sure we can upgrade much on Roslev. Mm-hmm. Because whoever comes in knows that when Hickey comes back, you know, Hickey might be above them in the pecking order. Or Hickey's not happy if, if the new guy's above Hickey. So I think it's very difficult to get someone who's an upgrade and also happy to be second choice for a club like Brentford. 
Yeah. Um, it didn't surprise me the lineup at all um, because those are the players we have. I think the, the only change I would have perhaps made a bit, bit further up the pitch is I'm still an advocate, I think, for Dam's guard instead of Yanel in the middle, just because I think he offers something a bit different. I think Yanel can be quite similar to Norgard in some ways. And I think Yanel can be quite a good utility play, player, perhaps. But I don't think he needs to start every single week. And again, that's nothing against him. I think he's a very solid player. He always gives six or seven out of ten. But I just think maybe we need a slightly more creative midfielder, someone that can offer something a little bit different alongside Jensen. But apart from that, I'm not I'm not surprised at the team at all. I thought Damsgaard did really well when he when he came on as well. I think we'll, we'll talk yeah. about Damsgaard. Let's start with. I was going to say we could start with how kind of we grew into the game because I did think the first kind of 15, 20 minutes, Palace were probably the better of the two teams. Um, and then the big talking point of the game, and I think we'll all be in agreement about the disallowed goal. Eze kind of whips it near post. Um, lots of angry dads on the West End shouting at Flecken for it. Um, Glasner said afterwards, it's over. It makes no sense. It is what it is. There was also a very tight penalty before, and I'm assuming that he's talking about the Mateta uh, uh, penalty. That was, never, uh, that was right in front of from us. Where, from where I was, it looked like a stone wall penalty. Nah. Genuinely, I was I was so expecting the VAR purple box to come up. But anyway, he said, but we talk about what we can influence and you see where the penalty is. And we had three against two. We have to play the pass better. Then we can score the goal and without depending on the penalty or not. Um, Glasner's interviews took it like a champ, to be fair. Even Eze after the game, his, his post-match was really good. There was no yeah. kind of mad complaints or anything like that thoughts on the disallowed goal craig and then we'll go to flecken after that firstly what a goal Let, yeah. let's let's give that to him what a bloody goal that is and there's there's very 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 few players in the premier league that would even try that to, for starters but sa is one hell of a player um mm -hmm. absolutely fantastic player and, and and crystal palace have done so well to keep hold of him for as long as they have um <laughs> I don't know how you can play the goalkeeper for that one because that is a very similar situation to what David Rea conceded in the player final against Fulham. Um, the referee very, very clearly thinks he's going to cross. All 22 players on that pitch, plus all the officials and the fans, thought that Eze was going to cross, which is why the referee blew the whistle so quickly because he just assumed that there would be you know, stopping a defender from making a clearance, but he's shot, he's caught the referee off guard, he's caught everyone off guard. People blaming the goalkeeper for that one, you've got to watch it back because no but no goalkeeper is saving that. He's he's hit that so well with such accuracy. No goal is saving that. Um I mean I would I would be absolutely livid in the same way that the Palace fans are if that happened for us. Absolutely livid. So I mean, <laughs> we, that's the kind of luck that we didn't get last season, though. Let's let's be real. That's the kind mm. of luck we didn't get last season. So, hopefully, we, we see things turning a little bit and the fortunes maybe going in our favour throughout this year. But that that's, that's yet to be seen. But we just didn't have that kind of luck last year. So, it was nice for something crap to fall our way for once. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 100% agree. I think... Shout out to Will Sylvester, who's been on the podcast before, because I literally heard him say, <laughs> just before Eze took the free kick, I heard him say he's going to whip that near post, and he did. So thank fuck the whistle did go. Uh, so there was one person in the ground, Craig, that thought he was going to do that. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> all, all by one person. <laughs> there, was one, there was one person in the ground that thought he was going to do that, but fair play to pull it off, and I would be I would be livid if, if that happened to us. But let's talk about Flecken. Dan, I'm going to hand to you first, and then we'll come to Craig, because I know that you want to talk about Flecken. Um, made some really big saves in the second half, and after watching them back, they're, they're both of those chances. I think there's two. They're they're really strong hands, so it is it is nice. Do you know what I think his weakness is? Is that it's his, sometimes it's long shots that that somehow stifle him. He just seems a bit slow to get across his line at points. But when it's like a snapshot, like it was for Eze when he had those couple of chances towards the end of the game, he he does well with those. Like the quick reaction saves. It's almost like when he's got more time to think about it. That's when. He can it's unravel, striker, isn't it? As well, yeah. If but you see a striker with too much time. What What I will say is his distribution again. If you watched Flecken's distribution, it is his it, pinpoint ninety nine percent of the time. It is it's so good, especially when he's finding our fullbacks on each side. Uh, so if there's anything, if there's anything he needs to add to his game, it's just it's just staying sharp. But Dan, what what did you make of it? Yeah, I mean, and there was just one occasion in the first half of his distribution where we gave away that free kick just outside the area. Um, mm -hmm. That was the only part of distribution. That was the one percent. Obviously, 
yeah that was a one percent um <laughs> Yeah, they, they were brilliant saves. I kind of think he, he is a bit of a confidence player because I think he even spoke about it in recent interviews about how he started last season and he wasn't feeling himself. And I think he even said that Man City game where he, you know, made all those saves, he, that changed it for him. And from then he felt like himself again. And I, I do feel like maybe he just does need that confidence to, to not work, not overthink things, not worry about things so much believe in his own ability um and you can't help but think maybe the criticism he does get you know sometimes does get back to him and you know i i do believe players read things even if they try to avoid it sometimes it might be difficult to avoid um but if he has that confidence and backing i think you know that there is a keeper in there we've seen it now since the middle of last season and i wasn't particularly worried going into this season given that form Hopefully, again, those saves towards the end of the game to help us get the three points. Hopefully that gives him the confidence to keep keep going in the next few games. 100%. I think as well, we kind of touched on it last season, that it, it kind of the pylon is just, the pylon's not warranted. It's exactly what you say. It's I, I wonder, like, like there's a lot of noise about it during the England uh, campaign about, you know, how much can you take into account the noise and the criticism and everything. And I was listening to Carl Walker speak the other day and he said, it's virtually impossible and we are just all human. If we get a bad comment on the podcast, we don't because we're the best brand for podcasts around. But if we did get a bad comment on the podcast, it would be the only one that would stick out to any of us that were reading the comments. So when it's filled with it, and even yesterday, people calling him shit and it's just filled with Twitter, just people just like really just going over the top and escalating that pile on. If that comes back to him, it's just going to make him feel like shit and it's going to make him feel like he did at the start of last year when all the mistakes started happening and probably going to make more mistakes. Craig, over to you, mate, because you, you messaged me about it. There, there, there are several people on Twitter, and we all know who they are, who who like to pile on the pressure for him as well. Um, <clears throat> yeah, but last, last season, last season we were having many conversations about Flecken, for the, rightfully so, because up until that Man City game, he, he probably didn't warrant playing as many games as he did. And I did stick up for him, and I did believe that the tide would turn, and it did. Thankfully, he didn't make me look so stupid. Uh, the, the tide did turn. That City game, as Dan's mentioned, when when he just had a, a blinding game and, and everything that was going towards him, he was saving. And unfortunate with the with the first one that went in, and they were just unbelievable that day. So not much you can really do against Man City. But for 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 more or less forty six games last season, we said he needs to win us points for yeah. him to show value in himself and in the team. He needs to win us points. We've had one game of the season, and he won us that game. I, I, I'm I'm adamant that he won us that game. Dan, the one and Mike, the ones that you mentioned, where he's making them snapshot saves. That one from Eze right at the end takes a huge deflection off of Nathan Collins, and he manages to change his body position and flick the ball around the post with that right hand. Last season, he probably wouldn't have made that save, or at least. 30 games of last season, he wouldn't have made that save because he'd have just dropped to his knees and it would have floated over his shoulder. And we can all envision it, envisage that happening. We can see it. But we said that he needs to win us points and he's already done that this season. He won us the game, well, kept us in the lead. He, he got us three points instead of one point. So what he now needs to do is needs to build on the fact that he is earning us points as a team. He needs to carry on showing his value as in the starting eleven. But he also needs to keep in mind that we've got a very, very, very good young goalkeeper in Valdemarsen sniffing, uh, sniffing in his ear, letting him know that he is there, looking over his shoulder at that start in 11. And we know within the club how highly rated Valdemarsen is. If Mark Flecken has a spell in which he had last year, I see him actually being dropped this year for Valdemarsen. I know that people liked Strakosha, but they liked Strakosha purely because he wasn't Mark Flecken. Flecken. <laughs> purely because he wasn't Mark Flecken. But when people say they like Valder Martin, they can say that because he's actually a bloody good goalkeeper. Mm -hmm. Strakosha's gone to Athens, and in the first game, he's got lobbed by the goalkeeper, by the opposition goalkeeper, and given the ball straight away to the opposition and lost in the Conference League or whatever it lost, was. He wasn't really that good. Strakosha. Why have you been watching Greek football? No, it was just the goals that got posted onto the timeline. Oh, sorry, that's oh, right. okay. Okay, keep just got just got posted onto onto Twitter and someone someone quoted it. But they 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 
they liked Strakosha because of how much they disliked Flecken. But yeah, we've got a good, we've got a good good backup goalkeeper this year, so he needs to he needs to have a good season. Mark Flecken does. We we've almost got as many goalkeepers on the books that Chelsea do. <laughs> Didn't we sign? We got Malcolm. <laughs> we got Winterbottom in the B team. Didn't we sign an American kid from, from the right, MLS yeah. as well? We've got like six goalkeepers at Brentford. It's crazy. Anyway, let's 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 uh, not talk about the net. Well, not negatives, but let's move on to the positives, and we'll talk about the front three in a bit more detail because the Brian Wisser Shada link up. I'm hoping is a sign of things to come this season. Now Tony's out the door, and. What the first goal is just it's just unreal. It's just a really, really nicely worked goal. I've seen different angles of it. Brentford posted a different angle this morning. But the one touch play in and around the midfield, and then Brian and Wisser. I saw a tweet that I found hilarious. It was like the Brian and Wisser combination is what nostalgia heads would look back on in like 15 years. We'll look back on like 15 years as like prime Barclays. But Brian cutting in on his left hand, it, he does it so often. And we criticised him for it in the championship because I think players start to figure him out. But it's almost now that he's kind of got past the, it's all I'm going to do. And sometimes he does go down the line. He ju- he does it, and you just you can't stop him when he's on when he's on fire like he was yesterday. He's he's so good, and I'm so so I'm, I was fingers crossed, touch wood. I'm so happy that we've got him for another season because 23 goals in 21 assists since 2021-22 PL season. Only two players have more and who have more goals and more assists in fewer games than him in that span. And those two players are Kevin De Bruyne and James Madison. So he is in unreal company, Dan. Yeah, he's grown so much. I mean, he's ready to be the main man now if Ivan leaves. Um, I mean, with Wisser as well, what an opportunity it is for him this season to be the main man for half a season. I'm, I'm really confident that he will get a good number of goals and they seem to have a very good relationship together, them two in particular. Um, it's very difficult to stop. I mean, that whole front three were very quick, very dynamic, more more dynamic than they would have been with Ivan in the middle. Um, Whistle, I've always seen better down the middle than on the left, so hopefully we'll see more of that now. I think even in the lead-up to the goal, this, the way we moved it forward, slick passing, quick passing, we didn't do so much of just the passing left and right at the back and not really going anywhere with it. We were trying to to do things with it. And obviously, I think that is slightly more high risk. It will result in some more, you know, turnovers where we lo- do lose the ball deep. But with those three, I mean, there's the pace on all of them. You know, that is enough to scare defences. And it's a different way of attacking. But you can see that we've planned for this succession plan after Ivan Tony, and it is a brilliant way. It's, it's going to be more like to the championship days, the way we used to play then. Yeah. You know, it's the sort of dynamic front three that we, we that is exciting. Did, I'm um, trying not to get, I'm not try, go on, Craig, go on, Craig. I, I was, all I was going to say was, did either of you watch Match of the Day last night uh, after the game? Obviously, yeah. in the evening, obviously. Um, yeah. It was, it was, it was refreshing to see them complementing Brentford's adaptability. You know, people think that we're such a Route 1 team because of Ivan Tony, and that is what we have been for large large periods of the time while we've been in the Premier League, a very Route 1 team. Get the ball up to Ivan and let him make something happen. But it was nice watching the three of them talking about the adaptability of Brentford and the way that Thomas Frank, as a manager, is not scared and not afraid to change the play style. We, we, we were just brilliant. I thought when we had the ball down on the floor, when we had the ball on the floor, they couldn't get anywhere near us. And um, what I want to do, uh, just to build on something that Dan said about about Wisser, um, Brentford posted this earlier, and I don't know if you've written it in the in the running order, Mike. Is is Johan Wisser is the first player to score and assist in three consecutive games since Riyad Mahrez in December 2021. Good stat. Good, good stat. They're on fire, mate. They're on fire. I'm, trying, I'm trying my best not to get excited because I know it's just the first game. <laughs> and we, we, <laughs> and we, we said it. You're in that weird kind of limbo as a football fan in the pre-season and the build-up to the first game because all of your hopes can be dashed or they can be justified. But just after watching that and after what the front three is going to be a hell of a lot of fun to watch up until up until whenever Tiago gets back and even when Tiago gets back he's such a yeah. different player to Tony that it won't be too far off what we're seeing now and the aerial obviously you lose a lot of things when when you when you play Ivan uh 
when you play Ivan Tony and you gain a lot of things too. They're two the front three that we had against on Sunday was completely different to anything that we've seen so far, really, because we've had an injured front three. And when we've tried to play that kind of dynamic, fluid pace everywhere, someone's been injured and it's not worked. But Kevin Sharda. His, the aerial presence, like obviously he doesn't have the kind of traditional hold-up play that Tony does, but Jesus, he has got a leap on him. If oh. Flecken finds him, he's going to win that header. <laughs> and when you've got when you've got Wisser and you've got Mbumo, there were so many points where Sharda would win a header or one of the front three would win a header. And quickly, so quickly, we're in a 3v3. And it's like, where, which way are they going to go in first half and in the second half? It is just going to be a lot of fun to watch this team. Um, and I'm really hoping, obviously, there's going to be some defensive issues and it's probably at times, if not all the time, going to get exposed by Liverpool on Sunday when we've got Salah running at a traditional centre-half and and Jota. And they looked pretty good against Ipswich in the second half and we'll get onto it. But it is going to be a lot of fun. If everyone stays fit, touch wood again, please no injuries this season. But it's going to be a lot of fun watching that front three and with Brian and Wisser in that kind of form and with Sharda as well. I saw some people saying that Sharda's useless. I was like, what game? What game are we watching? Genuinely, there, there were a couple of moments where his first touch was a bit off, but you can expect that it's his first game in competitive football since like Luton and he only got minutes there. Go on, Greg. He, he's, he was the probably the biggest player that grew into the game. Yeah. Um, we, we talked about Palace being on top, not necessarily dominating because we didn't get dominated at all in, in, in any spell of the game. They were on top for the sort of the first 20 minutes. And he was one of those players that that maybe highlighted himself as needs to get a bit of confidence and grow into the game. And he was so close to to, to giving a carbon copy goal of what he scored last year against them mm-hmm. when he cuts it back on his right foot. And it is so close. When they there's an angle from behind the goal, it, it is so close. It whistles past the boat post. He's so unlucky. One, one thing that gets me... His first touch, I don't know if you guys notice it or agree, his first touch is unbelievable. But his second touch is fucking awful. (laughs) (laughs) He he can bring the ball down and kill it and then just kick it away. And you're thinking, Kev, you've done the hard part, mate. (laughs) You've done the hard part. Uh, But he, he, he got better as the game went on. As the game went on, he got better. But yeah, it was bring the ball down perfectly, lose the ball and it was like come on kev you're better than that (laughs) he's got he's got a cheat code as well with his pace an absolute cheat code that there was a point in the second half when he beat like three men by doing the exact same skill three times just knocking it past them and running it was just he's he's like a player that i think a few i think jay said on the totally football podcast and and a few other people said watch out for him this season because He's basically been injured his entire career at Brentford. And we saw like glimpses of it in his first season when he come off the bench. But now <clears throat> it feels like he's probably going to lock down that left wing position. I think it could be a really, really big season for Kevin Sharda. And he's probably going to go as like the understudy to Wisser and Mbume because they'll be the ones scoring all the goals. But in terms of a flair player and in terms of someone who could who really excites you, you want to you want to, you look forward to watching him when you go to Brentford. I think he's going to be that guy and make just all the front three. They were brilliant, and we've got strength and depth as well with KLP coming on. Anyway, without getting too excited, like you mentioned, Craig, up until their goal, their their, their equaliser, I didn't think really they were really in that second half, and then they get the equaliser, the momentum kind of shifted, but then we get our goal. Kind of, I don't want to say out of nowhere because there wasn't. I didn't feel like they had any like real clear cut opportunities bar their disallowed goal, their second disallowed goal of the match. Um, we get our goal. And then I think that's a good place. To, I think our goal, there's not really much to say about it. It's a bit scrappy, but obviously it's nice to see Wissa get off the mark for the season and combine uh, up in those, uh, even the build-up play to that one. It was kind of similar to the first. I'm not sure if they showed it on match that day, but they definitely didn't show it in the short highlights. But the build-up, the interplay between Jensen, uh, Damsgaard, and I think it was Madsen down in that corner when they just kept it amongst themselves and then the ball comes in with a lot of pace, which is good. But, what I wanted to get onto, once we get that second goal, the the defending on display throughout the whole game, to be honest, from Nathan Collins was just unbelievable. He had his Maldini-esque performance against Chelsea away last year. And this season, he's chosen the first day to do it again. So we just need to pray that he is like that all season because, I mean, just breaking down his stats, Brentford tweeted, 90% pass completion, nine duels, one, eight recovery, seven clearances, one shot on target. But he was immense he was immense, Dan. And Ethan Pinnock, I know you love him, Dan, and we all love him. 
followed suit and he's just quietly excellent but he's always excellent the thing that's i think holding back nathan collins a little bit as he certainly did last season is that that consistency but when he's on it those two are just so solid done yeah well there's no better player to learn from if he's going to be him and pin at the partnership all season hopefully they both stay fit so they can really develop their relationship because i think that was probably an issue at times last season with the back line keep changing but if they can really develop that relationship there's no one better to guide Collins through games and, you know, ensure his levels remain higher than Ethan Pinnock. I think at times what we see with Collins is just a slight lapse in concentration where, you know, he'll just give away the ball. I mean, that game against Wolves last year where he just kept giving it away and it, it just spiralled. And But again, we know he's got it in him. He's still young, but he's also got quite a few years of Premier League experience now dating back to before he signed for Brentford. So this is his chance to step up. This is his time to, you know, really find a home at Brentford as well, because obviously he moved around quite a bit before before he joined us. I think he was only at his last couple of clubs for a season each. So, you know, he's more settled now. He's not a new player and I'm hoping he can really kick on this season. For sure. Fabio Carvalho making his debut, Craig. Were you impressed? Yeah, very. He's, um, he, he kind of... Uh... I don't know, I'm trying to, he seemed quite this is probably a massive stretch and I'm 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 probably very, very wrong here, but he that's seemed what very the first episodes of the season. That's what the first episode is <laughs> for. He seemed very Ben Rama esque when he got on the ball, like calm, composed, and I just felt like something was going to happen when he got on the ball. Now, he didn't really have as much time on the pitch as as we hoped he might have, but he looked, he looked sharp, he looked quick, he looked dangerous. And and uh, I think that's a good sign of things going forwards. I, I, I just, I want to backpedal a little bit. And I'm sorry to do this. I just want to point out how offensively, how offensively positive our defence was. Like we've mentioned I are playing at left back and the amount of times he made those bombing runs forward. He was. I thought he was actually really good, and a lot of people called him out yesterday as well for some reason. I don't know why, but I thought he was really good, and Nathan Collins as well. Just to point out, for that second goal, our furthest player forwards was <laughs> Nathan Collins. Our furthest player forward was Nathan Collins. He's the one that gets the ball down and gets the shot away. But <laughs> what the hell is he doing there? What's Mate, he doing? He's got good feet for a big man. He Probably really does have good feet. He's, he's got big... really good feet. There's a, oh, there's a few occasions. <laughs> what is no he idea. <laughs> Wasn't it second phase of like a throw-in? You know, sometimes even if we don't do the long throw now, we tend to get the centre-backs forward. And I think it's a really good idea because how many goals you score from a throw-in? But I think that's why he was there because it was a throw-in from not that long before. <laughs> well, but he, 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 he did last season. Even in the Chelsea away game last season, I remember thinking he's got really good feet. There was a couple of times where he had the ball high up or had the ball far back in our defensive third and he gets himself out of tight situations. It's just a case for him. It's just consistency because because yeah. he's there's just a player like, in there. There's a really good player in there. That's the thing. Like the that performance, the one against Chelsea last year, they're like they're, they're some of the best defensive centre half performances I've seen Bar Ethan Pinnock play for Brentford. So that's saying a lot. Um, and just long may that continue. We saw the game out nicely, genuinely. We did. Re and I try, you're laughing because I'm getting so I'm getting so gassed, overly gassed about this performance. But we, it was just it was nice. We, go on, Craig. Go on. We, we spoke last week, Mike. We spoke last week saying we're going to have to outscore Palace to win this game because every time when we played Wolfsburg, every time we went forward, we looked like scoring. Every time they came forward, we looked like conceding. But bar. Well, he, we scored no goal. Uh, bar maybe the one essay chance where he's beaten Nathan Collins, got a shot away when he's taken a deflection and Flecker's made a good save. I can't recall a clear cut chance that they had, bar the offside goal and the one that Eze, Eze Paul made a fucking make a good save with. Because we were so defensively solid, which I think surprised everyone, which is why everyone was so happy at the end of the game thinking we was not defensively poor. And we was worried about that going into this season with a back four, a makeshift back four, even though we expected it going into the game, a makeshift back four that put in a good, solid performance. And I think that's what people were so, so impressed by yesterday. Surpri surprised as well. Like, I fully expected yeah. coming into the game, I saw the lineup, and I was thinking, you know, everyone's tipping Palace to be the dark horses for Europe this season. And like you said, we limited them to so little. And largely with, with the exact same team bar Kevin Sharder that we had last year. Um, so, you know, 
it's, it's only going to get better when Rico Henry and Henry can come back. But it is just the, I need to temper this. This is just the first game of the season. I'm getting so excited. But <laughs> I just can't, I can't, nothing I can't wrong not. with it, mate. Nothing wrong with it. Nothing wrong with battered it. Battered like six nil on Sunday, and we bring us right that down to earth. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, let's let's talk about Liverpool. And there's anything else from the game that you two want to chat about? Uh, I can't think of anything in particular. Well, what I, what I, let's. I know we shouldn't talk about it, but we're one game in, and I'm only going to briefly mention the AR. What I want to talk about is what the hell we was waiting for after the Eze goal that was disallowed. Because he had very clearly blown the whistle and stopped the game before the ball had gone in the net. And Match of the Day did a big thing about it where they slow it down with the audio and you can hear the whistle before the ball hits the post and goes in. What are we then waiting for? Because yeah, he's so much the pressure game. on them. That's the thing. They're, they're scared to. They're scared to. They're looking for some sort of infringement that they can't find because, because they're just trying to make it foolproof. But it just takes so much time. And it, it is you. Everyone heard the whistle. You can see the whistle. As soon as the whistle goes, by the letter of the law, you can't it's intervene. Dead. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. So but then, um, but then we stood waiting for two minutes for something to happen, which we already know VAR cannot intervene because he's blown that whistle. And then the Premier League then post a statement of something that we already know to try and justify the actions of what they've done. Was well, that in the Premier League match, the new the new Twitter yeah. thing that they set up, the Premier League match centre? I just, yeah. I don't, I'm not sure about that idea. Like, they, I, Everyone's talking about the need for transparency and stuff, but I don't think like someone just typing out an explanation, and especially because they, they've said that they want to make the process clearer, but there are a couple of tweets on the match day that I just thought you've kind of just described what we've just seen as opposed to the thought process behind the decision. Yeah. So they definitely need to iron that out give, a little bit. If it's give, the, uh, think... give the referees them little speaker things that they do in the states now. <laughs> yeah. them the little speaker things. Make the referee admit to everyone in the stadium that he has just made a mistake. Yeah, sorry everybody, I've blown my whistle a bit too soon there. Well, the ball is dead. It's now a free <laughs> kick to Brentford. No, that would that would boil my fucking piss. That would be so <laughs> annoying. <laughs> That would be so annoying. Imagine that in the 94th minute. Sorry, guys. No goal. I've made a mistake. <laughs> Sorry, guys. My bad. No. My bad. <laughs> anyway, I next. did um, see on, um, this one more thing. Um, I, I did hear a couple of things that Gerhi might have been a bit lucky to stay on the pitch um, mm, with his yeah. challenge towards the end of the first half. Um, I don't think they showed it on match of the day. Um, no. But, yeah, I think there could have been a shout for a potential red there. But, obviously... Just you've seen them given. You've seen them. You've definitely yeah. seen them given. Yeah, it wasn't wasn't the greatest game for Gay as well, to be honest. I mean, all that interest from Newcastle. I think he's said in all of his interviews as well that he's like calm and collected, and he's just going to kind of see what happens. But uh, Brian and Wissa had him on ropes, <laughs> on absolute ropes, and I'm sure it won't be the first, uh, the last time this season that they terrorise a the defence. And I hope it's not the last time they terrorise a the defence. Anyway, come on, let's let's do Liverpool. Uh, different kind of test, I think. Maybe potentially people were a little bit overexcited by 45 minutes of good football at Ipswich on on the weekend for the for the early kickoff on Saturday, but there's quality everywhere. Uh, they've not signed anyone yet, which I still think is a bit strange. But there's quality everywhere. We don't know so much about Arna Slot, and there's not too much you can take from it with Ipswich, with it being Ipswich, the only side that they've played. Um, last season, I think that three nil scoreline maybe flattered them a little bit. I remember coming away uh, from watching it and thinking. The 3-0 was really not justified there. I think we actually played pretty well, but I think Salah scored the first, and then when that's once the first goes in, it's difficult. Uh, any changes to the lineup, Dan? Could you see? I, I do think Thomas Frank still might go back to the back five against the, these kind of teams, and I don't necessarily disagree. I think, although we were quite solid defensively against Palace, I'm still not fully convinced that there won't be games where we are found out a little bit, especially with the lack of depth at fullback. Um, the only issue still remains who would play left wing back in a, even in a back five because whoever mm. plays is gonna be it's gonna feel a bit awkward. And you want someone who can also bomb on as well in a back five. So you know you you're perhaps looking at putting a midfielder there, which I feel a bit yeah. uneasy about. The, the only thing that I could possibly think of would have to be Yan out goes there, right? Because yeah. Yeah. Uh, if you if you start Aya there, and then start Ben Me as the third centre back, that means that with the greatest of respect to him, 
Jisoo is probably the next senior centre back that we've got at the club, mm-hmm. and that, to have that as your as your your backup, I mean, you, you just, you'd probably think or you'd like to think that Yanel steps in at left wing back. You have Aya, Pinnock, and Collins as your three centre backs with Rosev on the other side, but you can't you can't call that, can you? The thing with Jisoo as well, because he's not good out on loan or anything. I kind of, I want, I want to see him this season because we see him in the preseason games and he looks good. But if we're not going to play him, then surely we, we send him out somewhere or give him some minutes at some point. Yeah, um, but I, well, I was going to say it wouldn't be Liverpool, but we did it with Yarmo last year, and he was mustard at yeah. Liverpool last year. Yarmo was, but centre backs are totally different ball games, a totally different position, and. Um, and can you really throw him in against Luis Diaz, Mo Salah, Cody Gakpo, you know, Darwin yeah. Nunes? Can you throw him in that that deep of a of a deep end? In his <laughs> that deep like of a deep first, end. <laughs> that deep of a deep end. You know what I mean? That's that's like that's like a deep 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 end. You know what yeah. I mean? <laughs> like, that's I don't really know a different football analogy to use there. Do you know what I mean? Like no, it's, it's fair. kind of a crazy crazy one to throw him in. So. If we're going to be adaptable, it means that Yano has to play left back or, or someone has to play KLP. <laughs> He's going to step back in at left wing back again. <laughs> no, he can't do that to KLP again. Dan, how are you feeling ahead of it, mate? I think these are the sorts of games uh, where we do probably would benefit from a kind of big guy up front to play off of. So I think it's going to be a lot more difficult against Liverpool's press at Anfield to play out from the back. So I think perhaps maybe even like Sharda, I mean, he's, he's, he's the one of our attackers who you can perhaps go long to, and he, he can look to win some flick ons. Um, I'm not expecting too much. I mean, with all of our first away games, you've got a nightmare yeah. um, first few away games this season. So it, it's nice that we're off the mark. It's nice that we've got some points. So I don't really see too much pressure on this one. Um, it's a team, another team we haven't beaten. And obviously we haven't beaten Palace before. Um, for, we beat um, Liverpool. Did we? Beat we? I, thought, I remember the 3-3. Three, three. We, we beat have just 3-1. Three, one. One. Last, three, last one, baby. season we've beaten 3-1, was it? Ah. Season before last. Season, season before last. Yeah, it couldn't what have been last season. Home last season? Uh, we got battered 4-1. Oh, yeah. Lost that was three one of the away. stinking games. Yeah. The yeah. Season we did beat them. I remember it now. I remember it now. Yeah. And Burma. Oh, that, was, that was after the TNT pot, TNT interview where I said, I oh, will put three past them again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, it was. It was that one. It was yeah. that one. Yeah. But I I, th- I agree, Dan. I think it is a bit of a free hit. Obviously, we're going to come down from that high of Crystal Palace on Sunday, but these aren't the games that we really need to be winning. Um, I know we've got a good record against the top six, but probably we don't have a good record against Liverpool. But if there's a time to play them, it's definitely this point in the season because it will be their second competitive match of Arnie Slot's reign as Liverpool manager. And the players will be full of confidence. I think I think you're right. I think we probably will go back to a back five. Uh, whoever drops out is a mystery. But I do think you're right in that having that outlet. So someone like Sharda um, would, be, would be very handy, especially with the pace that he's got as well. You can imagine sitting in that low block. The space opens up for him. And then we're laughing and we're three it up and we're and we've got the first win away. <laughs> did I can't see what happened with Tom O'Brien? Huh? Yeah, yeah. If you're playing a back five, and I'm guessing it'll be a front two, then I yeah. can't see him dropping Whistle or O'Brien over Sharda. Yeah, Unless no, he, he won't. Like two, three, just go two, two midfielders and let the other three run and racket. Did, yeah. did 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 either of you watch the Liverpool game on Saturday? Yes, time? I did. Yeah, I thought how now. now a lot of people have said this about him for the last the last maybe season or two. Van Dijk, I don't know about you guys, so watching him, he looked quite leggy. Like he didn't seem to be able to keep up with Kwanzaa and and Robertson either side of him. So so he he might be getting to that point of seniority now within this their squad that he could end up being a target. Now, that seems like an absolutely crazy thing to say, knowing that two, three seasons ago he was the best defender in the world at the time. But he's he's just hitting that point now where not much is really changing around him and they've become a little bit stale. I thought the first half of their game was really dull. And Ipswich were 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 had were quite unlucky to not go ahead, actually. They they caught them on the counter, 
um, but couldn't finish uh, the shot. I think it was Hutchinson had an effort on the at the edge of the box and couldn't get it couldn't get it in. But they're they're a team which nothing has changed since last year. They're still the same players. If we can run at them, we've done it before. We've done it before. I'm going to eat my words massively. I know I am. <laughs> but we've done it before. And if we run at them, Brian Lav, Brian Wisser and Sharda will have him on toast. I will have him on toast. All, all, four, all four of them. Because Trent, Trent, he. I was watching the Liverpool game. Everyone in that second half in the Liverpool team had a great game, but he stunk the place out. As a footballer, he absolutely stunk their team out. Who, Trent or Van Dyke? Trent, Trent. Really? Yeah, I thought he stunk the team out. Really? Yeah. I thought yeah. I thought he everyone's been yeah. waxing lyrical about Trent. Yeah, yeah. I didn't think he was great, man. I really didn't think he was great. I watched that. That was that was one of the ones on Saturday that I, I watched, and I just did not. I did not think he did well at all. I really didn't okay. think he did well. Well. well May that be a good point to wrap things up. We'll have Sharda or Whistle, or Brian and Bumo targeting Trent Alexander Arnold. We know that he's oh. not great, great defensively. But yeah, I think it, it's gonna be interesting. Definitely it's not it's not a pressure game or anything like that. It's the first game against one of the big six, and it's the first of like quite a tricky run of away fixtures. So it is Liverpool away, then it's Southampton at home, then City away, and then Tottenham away. That is quite tricky. Yeah. So well, it makes, it, it makes it, it, next away game after isn't that. it isn't yeah. it? It's Liverpool, it's Liverpool, Southampton, international break. Yeah. Should, I'm saying should, have Rico and Aaron Hickey back after the international break Very for true. City and Spurs. Should. They should have been back about six months ago, but we're going for this. We're, we're aiming for this one. Come on, Brentford. Get it done. Get it yeah. done. 100%. I think that's be a good point to wrap up the podcast, guys. The Elon Murray podcast will be back in midweek with a Liverpool preview. So do keep your eyes peeled for that. Also drop a comment down below. How impressed were you with the performance against Palace? Are we going to miss Ivan Tony? Do we play better football without Ivan Tony? What do you think of his transfer to Saudi Arabia? Let us know in the comments. Remember to subscribe to the YouTube and Spotify channels and also give us a follow on our socials. That's at the Ealing Road on Twitter and at Ealing Road Pod on Instagram. Chaps, first win of the season under the belt. It's been a pleasure. Up the bees. Up the bees. <laughs>